you created sci-fi over two decades ago now yes that right yes i love to talk about sci-fi sci-fi <laughs> was really my baby <laughs> <laughs> what is it yeah. uh what was its goal what is its goal how does it work yeah fantastic so sci-fi was effectively here i'm using python mm -hmm. to do stuff that i previously used matlab to use and i was using numeric which is an array library that made a lot of it possible but I, you know, there's things that were missing. Like I didn't have an ordinary differential equation solver I could just call, right? I didn't have integration. Hey, I wanted to, to integrate this function. Okay, well, I don't have just a function I can call to do that. Um, these are things I remember being critical things that I was missing. Optimization. I just want to pass a function to an optimizer and have it tell me what the optimal value is. Uh, those are things like, well, why don't we just write a library that adds these tools? And I started to post on the mailing list and there had previously been you know, people have discussed, I remember Conrad Henson saying, wouldn't it be great if we had this optimizer library or yeah. David Ash would say this stuff. And, and I'm, you know, I'm a ambitious, a, a, ambitious is the wrong word, an eager and uh, probably more time than sense. I was, you know, a poor graduate student. Uh, my wife thinks I'm working on my PhD and I am, but part of the PhD that I loved was the fact that it's exploratory, mm -hmm. right? You're not just, you know, taking orders, fulfilling a, a list of things to do. You're trying to figure out what to do. And so I thought, well, I, you know, I'm writing tools for my own use in a PhD, so I'll just start this project. And so in 99, 98 was when I first started to write libraries for Python. Effectively, when I fell in love with Python 98, I thought, oh, well, there's just a few things missing. Like, oh, I need a reader to read DICOM files. I was in medical imaging and DICOM was a format that I want to be able to load that into Python. Okay, how do I write a reader for that? So I wrote something called, it was an IO package, right? Mm -hmm. And that was my very first extension module which is C. So I wrote C code to extend Python so that in Python I could write things more easily. That, that combination kind of hooked me. It was the idea that I could, here's this powerful tool I can use as a scripting language and a high level language to think about, but that I can extend easily. In C. Easily in, the, in C. That easily for me because I knew enough C. Right. And then Guido had written a link. I mean, the only the hard part of extending Python was something called the way memory management works and you have to do reference counting. And so there's there's a, tracking of reference counting you have to do manually. And if you don't, you have, ref you have memory leaks. <laughs> and uh, so that's hard. Plus then C, you know, it's just much more, you have to put more effort into it. It's not just, I have to now think about pointers and I have to think about stuff that is different. I have to kind of, you're like putting a new cartridge in your brain. Mm -hmm. Like you're, okay, well, I'm thinking about MRI, now I'm thinking about programming. And, and there are distinct modules you end up having to think about. So it's harder. And when I was just in Python, I could just think about MRI right. and high level writing. Um, but I could do that, and that kind of, I liked it. I found that to be enjoyable and fun. And so I ended up, oh, well, let me just add a bunch of stuff to Python to do integration. Well, and the cool thing is, is that, you know, the power of the internet, I just looking around, and I found, oh, there's this NetLib, which has hundreds of Fortran routines that people had written in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. In Fortran 77, fortunately, it wasn't Fortran 60s. It had been ported to Fortran 77. Mm -hmm. And Fortran 77 is actually a really great, language. <laughs> Fortran 90 probably is my favorite Fortran because it's also it's got complex numbers, got arrays, and it's pretty high level. Now, the problem with it is you'd never want to write a program in Fortran 90 or Fortran 77, but it's totally fine to write a subroutine in, right? And so, and then Fortran kind of got a little off course when they tried to compete with C++, but at the time, I just want libraries that do something like, oh, here's an ordinary first equation. Here's integration. Here's run cut it integration already done. I don't have to think about that algorithm. I mean, you could, but it's nice to have somebody who's already done one and tested it. And so I sort of started this journey in 98, really, if you look back at the mailing list, there's sort of this, this productive era of me writing an extension module to connect runge cut integration to Python and making an ordinary additional equation solver. And then releasing that as a package. So we could call ODE pack, I think I called mm -hmm. it then quad pack and then i just made these packages eventually that became multi-pack because they're originally modular you can install them separately but a massive problem in python was actually just getting your stuff installed at the time releasing software for me like today it's you know, people think what does that mean well then it meant some poorly written web page i had some bad web page up and i put a tarball just a mm -hmm. gzip tarball of source code that was the release but okay can we just stand that sure. because that the community aspect of creating the package and sharing that yes that's rare that to, to have to both what have the, at that time so like the yeah, Ross, it was pretty early yeah so oh well not not rare maybe maybe you can uh correct me on this but it seems like in the scientific community so many people you were basically solving the problems you needed to solve 
to process the particular application, uh, yeah. the, the data that you need. And to also have the mind that I'm going to make this usable for others, that's... Um, I would say I was inspired. I'd been inspired by Linux. I'd been inspired by you know, Linus, Linus and him making his code available. And I was starting to use Linux at the time. And I went, this is cool. So I'd kind of been previously primed that way. And generally, I was, I'm, I was into science because I liked the sharing notion. I liked the idea of, hey, let's if collectively we build knowledge and share it, we can all be better off. Okay, so you were right? energized by that idea. So I was energized by that idea already, yeah. right? And I can't deny that, I was. I'm sort of, a, had this very, I liked that part of science, that part of sharing. And then all of a sudden, oh wait, here's something, and, and here's something I could do. And then I, I slowly over years learned how to share better so that you could actually engage more people faster. One of the key things was actually giving people a binary they could install, right? So that it wasn't just your source code, good luck compile this and then it's compiled ready to install you just you know so in fact a lot of the journey from 98 even through 2012 when we used to when i started anaconda was about that like mm -hmm. it's why uh you know it's really the the key as to why a, a scientist with dreams of doing mri research ended up starting a software company that yeah. installs software i work with a few folks now that don't program like on the creative side the video side the audio side and because my whole life is run on scripts, I have to try to get them. To, I have, I'm having now the task of teaching them how to do Python enough, yeah, to run the scripts. And so I've been actually facing this, whether it's on the con or some, with the task of how do I minimally explain, basically, to my mom how to write yeah. run a Python script. <laughs> yeah. And it's an interesting challenge. I have to. It's a to do item for me to figure out like what is the minimal amount of information I have to teach. What are the tools you use? That yes. one you enjoy it. To your effect of it, and the, they're related. Those are two related questions. And and then the debugging, like the the iterative process of running the script to figure out what the error is, maybe even for some people to do the fix yourself. Yeah. Uh, so do you compile it? Do you like how do you distribute that code to them? And it's interesting because I think it, it's exactly what you're talking about. If you increase the circle of empathy, that the the circle of people that are able to use your programs you increase it, it's like effectiveness and it's power. And so yeah. you have to think, you know, can I write scripts? Can I write programs that can be used by by medical engineers, by all kinds of people that don't know programming? And actually maybe plant a seed, uh, have them catch the bug of programming so that they start on a journey. And that's a huge responsibility and ultimately has to do with the Amazon one-click buy like how, how frictionless can you make yes. the early steps? Frictionless is actually really key to grow in any community is every, any friction point, you're just gonna lose, you're gonna lose some people, Yeah. right? Now, sometimes you may wanna intentionally do that. If you're early enough on, you need you know, a lot of help. You need people mm -hmm. who are, have the skills. You might actually, it's, it's helpful. You don't necessarily have too much, too many users as opposed to contributors if, the co if you're early on. Anyway, there's um, uh, sci-fi started in 98, but it really emerged as this collection of modules that I was just putting on the net. People were downloading. And, it, you know, not, I, don't know I think I got 100 users, right, by the, yeah. by the end of that year. But, there, but the fact that I got 100 users and more than that, people started to email me with fixes. Like, yeah. And that was actually intoxicating, right? That was, the, that was the, you know, here I'm writing papers and I'm giving conferences and I get people would say hello, but yeah, good job. But mostly it was you're reviewed with, it's competitive, yeah. right? You publish a paper and people are like, oh, it wasn't my paper, yeah. you know? It, 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 I was starting to see that sense of, of academic mm -hmm. life where it was so much, I thought there was a cooperative effort, yeah. but it sounds like we're here just to one-up each other. Right. <laughs> and, you know, it's not, that's not true across the board, but a lot of that's there. But here in this world, I was getting responses from people all over the world. Uh, you know, I remember Piero Peterson in Estonia, right, was one of the first people. And he sent me back this make file because, you know, the first thing it is, yeah, your build thing stinks and here's a better make file. <laughs> now, it was a complex make file. I don't think I, I never understood that make file actually, but it worked and it did a lot more. And so I thought, thanks, this is cool. And that was my first kind of engagement with community development. But, you know, the process was he sent me a patch file. I had to upload a new tarball. And I just found I really love that. And the, and the style back then was here's a mailing list. It's very, it wasn't as, there certainly weren't the tools that are available today. It was very early on. But I really started to, that's the whole year. I, I, I think I did about seven packages that year, right? And then by the end of the year, I collected them into a thing called multi pack. Mm -hmm. So in 99, there was this thing called multi pack. And that's when 
a high school student, I didn't know he was a high school student at the time, a guy named Robert Kern, took that package and made a Windows installer, right? And then, of course, a massive increase of usage. So by the way, most of this development was under Linux. Yes, yes, it was on Linux. I was a Linux developer doing it on, on a Unix box. I mean, at, at the time I was actually getting into, I had a new hard drive, did some kernel programming to, to make the hard drive work. I mean, not programming, but modification to the kernel so I could actually get a hard drive working. I, I love that aspect of it. I was also in, in you know, at school, I was building a, a cluster. I took Mac computers like, uh, and you put Yellow Dog Linux on them. Uh, they were, at the Mayo Clinic, they were just, they had all these Macs that were older, they were just getting rid of. And so I kind of got permission to go grab them together. I put about 24 of them together in a cluster in a cabinet mm -hmm. and put Yellow Dog Linux on them all. And I wrote a C um, program to do MRI simulation. That was what I was doing at the same time for my day job, so to speak. So I was loving the whole process. At the same time, I was, oh, I need a ordinary differential equation. That's why ordinary differential equations were key was because that's the heart of a block equation for simulating MRI is an ODE solver. And so that's, um, but I actually did that. It does happen at the same time. That's why it was kind of what you're working on and what you're interested in, they, they're coinciding. I was definitely scratching my own itch mm -hmm. in terms of building stuff. And uh, which helped in the sense that I was using it for me. So at least I had one user. Yeah. You know, I had one person who was like, well, no, this is better. I like this interface better. And I had the experience of MATLAB to guide some of what those APIs might look like. But, you know, you're just doing yourself. You're building all this stuff. But with the Windows installer, it was the first time I realized, oh, yeah, the binary installer really helps people. And so that led to spending more time on that side of things. So around 2000, so I graduated my PhD in 2000, end of year, end of 2000. So 99, doing a lot of work there. 98, doing a lot of work there. 99, kind of spending more time on my PhD, you, you know, helping people use the tools, thinking about what do I want to go from here. There was a company, there was a guy actually, Eric Jones and Travis Vaught. They were two friends who founded a company called Enthought. It's here in Austin, still here. Um, and they, Eric contacted me at the time when I was a, uh, I was a graduate student still. And he said, hey, why don't you come down? We want to build a company. You know, we want, we're thinking of, you know, a scientific company and we want to take what you're doing and kind of add it to some stuff that he'd done. He'd, he'd written some tools. And then Piero Peterson had done FDPI. Let's come together and build, pull this all together and call it SciPy. Mm -hmm. So that's the origin of the SciPy brand. It came from, you know, multi-pack and a whole bunch of modules I'd written, plus a few things from some other folks, and then pull together in a single installer. SciPy was really a distribution of Python masquerading as a library. 